In this video, we'll be taking a look at this rather novel apparatus, which has been constructed recently. It consists of five individual glass envelopes, to which each lamp has been evacuated to a specific degree of vacuum, from left to right, very poor vacuum, all the way to very high vacuum, 10 to the minus 1 tor, all the way up to 10 to the minus 9 tor. This apparatus is intended to give the observer more of a quantitative relationship or distinction between glow discharge and plasma formations to that of applied high-frequency, high-potential alternating currents. Now, the construction of this device is quite simplistic. We do not have any inner electrodes within each bulb, but rather an affixed copper strap located near the base of each of the necks of the bulbs. And of course, all of them are connected in tandem and affixed and powered by a banana plug jack at the very end, so that each one in the end receives adequate and equal potential. Now to give an overview of our general operating condition, we have here our high tension supply, which is essentially a diaphanery machine, which is of course connected directly to the lamps, which are worked in tandem, and from there we observe the discharge glow. The diathermy unit, which we'll be using as our source of high tension current for this demonstration, essentially consists of an on and off switch, which is activated here, a rotary switch with multiple taps on the primary current transformer, which is the sole driving force of this unit, along with adjustable tungsten coated spark gaps to adjust the circuit resonance of the diathermy machine, but as well as the combined setup. Now, in other cases, I'll use an extra coil in tandem with another highly evacuated lamp, but of course, that's reserved for a different video. Nonetheless, this is our tuning action. Here, we have a high-tension lead, which essentially emanates from this end of the apparatus. We have a bushing and as well associated terminals, which give respective high-frequency, high-potentials. But in this circumstance, we'll essentially be using that terminal. Now, without further ado, I'll turn off the lights and turn the machine back on. And now we may observe the spectacular phosphorescence of the highly excited high-frequency plasma of these lamps. We could right offhand observe that the poor pressure bulb which has been evacuated to the lowest pressure possible, which is in this case 10 to the minus 1 tor, gives off an inherent purple glow of nitrogen. We see the rather beautiful magenta nitrogen color condensing near the bottom half of the lamp. And of course, the pinkish hue, which starts to collect near the neck of the lamp. Progressing over, we have the 10 to the minus 3 tor lamp, which gives off more or less a turquoise appearance combined with oxygen and nitrogen phosphorescence. But of course, the bluish color is associated with the excitation of oxygen trapped with inside the bulb from the evacuation process. Now, working our way further down the line, we start to see that this bluish color starts to become more inherent and more defined as in the case of the 10 to the minus 5 tour lamp, where the bulb is almost certainly a sky blue color. Note the projections or the condensed plasma around the electrode, the outer electrode that is, starts to produce a rather unusual beam or projection. Now, in that case, we do make use of it in tubes involving single electrodes, such as the Tesla shadow graph tube, the single wire terminal lamp, and etc., whereby that effect is utilized to a significant extent. But nonetheless, in this application, we find that the plasma starts to take on a different configuration. Now, as in this bulb, where the phosphorescence is mainly confining itself to the majority of the inner lamp, the 10 to the minus 5 tor bulb has a higher vacuum and possesses a phosphorescence which does not seem to confine itself to the inner wall of the glass, but rather starting to form an arbitrary spot near the center of the lamp where we kind of have this 
devoid of dark space surrounding this inner plasma sphere. Now, working our way even further down the line, we start to see that the color starts to stray away from a turquoise blue color and takes on more of a whitish appearance. This is the characteristic which Tesla was observing in his high frequency lamps and of course is here being duplicated to some extent. We also start to see that the congregating plasma, which is no longer bounded by the surface of the glass, is starting to become rather confined into spherical proportions. Now these two lamps are going to be of the most interest as these proportions are nearing the latter half or bottom end of the lamp, especially the 10 to the minus 9 tour lamp, which almost has half of the plasma to only one half the side of the sphere, which is quite unusual to the experimenter as you would expect plasma to be of uniform essence, but of course that ceases to exist. Now I will zoom in closer to show this behavior of the plasma. Inspecting these two lamps at the far right even closer, we find that the white appearance becomes more drastically defined. Now in terms of plasma formation, we find that these clusters become rather sensitive to nearby bodies as well as electric and magnetic fields. Now if I simply bring my hand near these bulbs, we find that there is a deflection of the gaseous matter to the opposite side of the lamp. And if I bring my hand directly to the surface of the lamp, we find that the phosphorescence becomes even more intense. And by placing one's hand on one side of the lamp, we find the plasma swing to the opposite side. Now this is a very distinct observation which Tesla made during his research of the late 1890s, which mimics this exact same result to some extent, of course. We find that there is an intense blue phosphorescence of the glass, which is attributed to the makeup of this borosilica glass. But nonetheless, the plasma itself starts to take on some rather peculiar properties. Now, if I bring a rare earth magnet, near the bulbs within around six inches, we could find that there is also a definite deflection of the plasma occurring, similar to that of a CRT tube, where we still have the same mass of the plasma deflecting to only one side of the lamp. Now, if I were to rotate the magnet upon its axis continuously, we find that there is an interesting wave motion occurring although the plasma is still confined to one spot. Now, if we try to observe the same effects which we have observed with lower evacuated lamps, we find that the same effect does not persist. I can place my hand within the vicinity of the bulb, and we do not see the plasma contorting to this peculiar observation which we found earlier. Rather that the plasma is quite expanded and contaminated with many impurities, that the same effect does not occur. But we do find that the gaseous medium within these bulbs becomes more conducting as I could take my hand near the lamp and we have a discharge able to pass from the glass to the hand, especially with poorly evacuated lamps. Not so much as the 10 to the minus 3 tour bulb, but of course, there still is a stronger perceptible discharge. Now we could use this apparatus to the best of our abilities for the experimenter as a guide to see the effects of high frequency and high frequency plasma formations as related to Nikola Tesla, Crookes, and Geisler. Of course, this realm of research is not as well understood as high tension DC plasma is concerned, but nonetheless this novel apparatus still provides us leeway and some historical insight to what was seen and observed almost 130 years ago.